finish up section 4.6. We've been looking at the graphs of the secant and cosecant functions and uh, just uh, within the last video or so we started looking at the graphs of the tangent and the cotangent functions. In fact, in the last video we went over the graphs of the parent functions which I have written down right here, y equals the tangent of x and y equals the cotangent of x. And I've gone ahead and recapped a little bit of the information because now I want to look at transformations to the graph. Uh, vertical uh, stretching, shrinking, horizontal stretching, shrinking, and of course uh, translations, vertical and horizontal translations. So in general, for the tangent, <coughs> the domain is everything except what makes the denominator, which remember that the tangent of x is the sine of x over the cosine of x, what makes the uh, cosine of x equal to zero. So we have to exclude pi over 2 plus all the, all the uh, integral multiples of pi added to pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, 5 pi over 2, 7 pi over 2, and the like. The range is the set of all real numbers because as you remember, for, hopefully we remember from just the video ago, the graph uh, is unbounded uh, both, uh, uh, it doesn't have a maximum, doesn't have a minimum, it's unbounded in both directions. In fact, uh, if you look over to the right there, I went ahead and graphed the cotangent in pink there because I want to use that before I graph uh, an example that involves translations and you can see how the arrows go up and go down well it's very similar for the tangent as well. So there is no amplitude because the amplitude is the maximum value minus the minimum value. Remember that the period for tangent and for cotangent, notice here all the similarities between these two graphs, uh, the, the period is pi we have vertical asymptotes at all those values that make the denominator zero. So we're going to have those sketched in. We also have symmetry to the origin, which means it's an odd function. And now what we're going to do is we're going to look at this kind of translation. But remember for cotangent, the, the main differences here between the two are that we have a slightly different domain because we have to exclude those values that make the sine zero because the cotangent of x is the cosine of x over the sine of x. And we also, of course, have vertical asymptotes at those same values. And we'll look at the cotangent graph as well. Now, the key here, A is going to stretch it or shrink it, but because there's no amplitude, uh, unless the values of A are very, very, very close to zero or very, very, very big absolute value-wise, you're not going to see a huge change, you know, if A is like a 2 or a 3 or a 4. You'll see some stretching or a half, a fourth, an eighth. You'll see some compressing down. Uh, this is going to be key. It's how the, uh, the period is affected and just like with sine and cosine and with secant and cosecant, you take the period of the original parent function and you divide it by the absolute value of b. And of course if a is less than zero, you're going to be reflecting this in the x-axis. And this is the same over here for the cotangent. So I'm going to, I have two examples. I have one example that's affected uh, by dilations. As you can see here, a is 4 and b is pi over 2. And I have one example where a is 1 and b is 1, but your h and your k, your phase shift and your vertical shift are not zeros as they are up here. Uh, this is going to be a phase shift of pi over 2 to the left, and this is going to be a phase sh uh, vertical shift to 3 downward. So let's start with this guy. And anytime I have a uh, change in period, I'd like to pick values to plug in for x so that when I multiply them times pi over 2, I get those values that I know a little bit about because I know a little bit about the unit circle and about the sines and the cosines of all the multiples of pi over 6 and pi over 4. So notice here, I pick numbers that when I plug in here, I get those kinds of values that I like to work with. Now, I know tangent is odd, so uh, an odd function, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to pick values around 0 here to the right and to the left so I can see how my graph is affected. Now, the period of the parent function is pi, so if I divide this by pi over 2, the absolute value of pi over 2, which is, which is pi over 2, this is pi over 1 times the reciprocal 2 over pi, and the period here, um, uh, let's just, yeah, the period here is equal to 2. Notice here on my graph, instead of having my x scale uh, in terms of pi, like pi over 6, pi over 4, and so on, I have it in terms of just the integers to make this a little bit easier. So, I am going to have me some vertical asymptotes. 
Uh, that was good English. All right, what we have right here at negative one and once is where the y value is undefined. So I'm going to draw. Oop. I'm going to try to draw some vertical asymptotes here that are two apart. I'm not doing a very good job. Hopefully you will use a straight edge and graph paper when you're working your problems out so you can get a much better looking graph than the one I'm producing so far. All right, let's plug in some values and hopefully you see the, uh, uh, the values giving you that curve that hopefully you came to know and love in the last video for the tangent. You're going to get that shape. So it should, it should kind of do one of these things. Remember, symmetry to the origin. So at uh, negative two-thirds, which would be about here, I am at negative four square roots of three. Now the square root of three is about 1.732. So negative four times about 1.7. It'd be about negative 6.8 and about negative 6.9, somewhere in there. So I am going to be way down here as far as my graph is concerned. One, two, three, four. That's not going to be enough. I'm going to be down here. I'm kind of fading into my other graph here. I'll just put it here as a guide to see how steep it is. Let's see. Be about down here. And then I've got negative four at negative one half, that'd be right here. And then I have, now that's negative 6.8 divided by three. So that'd be about negative 2.3, give or take. And that happens at uh, negative one third, about here. And then of course, zero, zero. And then I have uh, one third, about negative 2.3. Uh, I have, one half four, and then I have uh, two thirds, four square roots of three be way up here. Now, do you see the, the shape? Do you see how that's affected? This four out in front has stretched my graph out. You can see the basic curve here for the parent function for cotangent. We know for tangent, it's very similar. It kind of goes up like this through the origin, right? Well, you can see how it's been stretched out. It's not going to look vertical, but it starts to look like maybe these things line up, but they don't. You've got to come up and do the best job possible. Now, I'm not going to go all the way down here and be into my other graph, but you've got to do the best job possible to come up with a reasonable sketch. See how steep it is, how it's going to come right down through there? But I'm stopping here as I kind of try to do my best to come up with the curve here as well. See how steep it is? It's going to come right up through here, but I'm going to stop right here. And there it is. It's Like I said, it kind of looks like a line because I can't graph worth a darn anymore in my old age. But you get the basic shape here, and then I can continue this pattern. And complete Oop, that one's a little too wide there. I can do a better job than that, I think. And so on, and so on, and so on. And there's the graph there in green for y equals 4 tangent of power 2 times x. Again, if you have a change in period because of the value b here, what you should be looking at are values to plug in that when you multiply them times b gives you those nice uh, values that hopefully you remember the sines and cosines for. And therefore you can find tangents, secants, cosecants, cotangents, which is where we're at next. Now I went ahead for the second example and put the graph in pink there for y equals the cotangent of x. Because the graph, the basic shape has not changed. This is a rigid transformation. I'm going to go pi over 2 to the left and I'm going to go down three. Now, again, based on the space that I try to sneak this thing into, I'll do this one in black here so you can see it a little bit uh, better. I'm going to probably not have the purest looking graph. I hope I have something halfway reasonable for you. But notice here, pi over two to the left, that's this amount right here. That's pi over two. So my graph is going to be shifted to the left, pi over two, and then it's going to go down three spots. Now. 
I would suggest that you start with just one piece of the graph and then look for your pattern. So I'm going to look for key values here. For example, I'm going to start here with my x-intercept. I'm going to go pi over 2 to the left, and then I'm going to come down 3. So this point right there is right there. Now, what's happening with this, with this uh, horizontal um, asymptote? Well, it gets shifted pi over 2 to the left. So I'm going to bring that up like this. And I'm going to bring this one over pi over 2. And now this graph, this pink piece, is going to be down here. So it's going to look something like this. Plug in a few points to help you. And that's this part of the graph to the left and down. And then I'm going to continue that for the rest of my space that I have on here. I already shifted that. That'll come over here now. And there are my vertical asymptotes. And now it's a matter of getting my graph correct. Be right about there. And then it's going to go And down here it's going to go, and then it's going to come up like this. And then one more over here, I can squeeze one more in here. Not a great effort here, but I hope that it's enough, oh, not that much. I hope it's enough of an effort that you can see how the translations here, the horizontal translation of power 2 to the left, phase shift, and the vertical translation, vertical shift to 3 down. And that's a busy graph. So that's usually the time when it's that messy that I get my eraser and I start erasing everything except for the final product. And that's what I'm going to try to do here a little bit. Probably not my best effort overall and you'll be able to see that a little bit more readily once this purple and green, I'm not going to be able to erase that green, once that pink, purple, whatever you want to call that color and green have been eliminated there. The theme, I have my trusty index finger eraser and there you can see the graph. Alright, now once you have graphed the, uh, the sine, the cosine, the tangent, the cotangent, the secant, and cosecant, it gives you some insight on the functions. It's important to remember the key facts regarding domains and ranges, especially when you have vertical asymptotes, as we've had in this section. And, of course, you have to be aware of the fact that they're not always going to give you the parent graph. Sometimes you have to work with some kind of a uh, version of the parent graph where you've had some transformations involved. And that comes with practice, practice, practice.